we have our spy, Jonas Nye. He's not playing right. Come down. <laughs> and also uh, Maria Schrader, who's playing Lenora. Coming on. Come join us. Really enjoyed that. I'm, I'm sure everyone would agree. It's fantastic. And I hear, Anna, that the idea began with your daughter when she came home from school and said, I hear there was a wall in Berlin once. Yeah, when she was seven or eight, she came home from school and she said at dinner, there was a wall. And we were like, where? She says, right here in Berlin. And we were like really interested in how she would do, how she'd learned it. We said, what happened? And she said, they knocked it down with their hands and then everybody hugged. <laughs> we were just very moved by that. And they had built the wall with cardboard boxes at school and... Um, and then knocked it down and the school had been divided in between east and west it was to celebrate the reunification day and then they had all knocked down the boxes and, and hugged so that was yeah you know when you when you live in berlin and in germany now um you think and you have children you think a lot about how do you explain to them what things used to be like because it sounds like this crazy fairy tale you know like there was these two brother nations with missiles pointed at each other and um And certainly over here, if we see a drama about Germany, it's something up to 1945, it's Nazis or it's war or something. It's so refreshing to see something about a different chapter of German history. Were you keen to bring that to the screen? For sure. Yeah, um, we really wanted, uh, you know, one chapter of German history in the 20th century has a happy ending and, and it's this, right? I mean, usually the, the, the dramas about the Nazi era start in light times and then everything, you know, goes terribly wrong and uh and here we pitched it from the beginning we pitched it as a trilogy and here we we really have this uh, wonderful against every dramaturgical rule <coughs> no shot is getting fired and um and germany uh, gets re reunited it's, and thanks to individuals i mean at the end of the series we'll see a nato exercise that almost went terribly wrong you know we we owe this idea to Thomas Lovkov, who is here in the audience. He uh, he was our yeah, advisor yeah. on the show, he and he it. and he told us about this amazing uh, event in the in the fall of 1983, where the world almost came to an end because of a misunderstanding and mutual mistrust. And then there's you know individual heroes like Jonas, who basically <laughs> saved the world. Well done, Jonas. Good work. Um, and you also have your own experiences of sort of being spy York in West Germany. Can you tell us about that? Oh, uh, well, spy. I wasn't, yeah, not, not, well, so, yeah, well, I guess intelligence in the broadest sense. I was in West Germany. I was, um, I went uh, to the, I, I was in the West German military um, for 15 months and I learned Russian for um, three months, eight hours a day. And then uh, they gave me these huge um, headphones that you see on the show. And uh, I was listening to the Russian troops in the GDR. And um, the Russians sometimes would send us messages, um, you know, about us, about ourselves. And so we knew that um, they knew that we were listening to them. And uh, we knew we had a mole on the base. And uh, I've been, you know, we've been wrestling with that idea of the mole uh, for a while and uh, what kind of drama we could make uh, out of out of the a situation comedy. comedy thriller or something and then uh, Anna had the great idea of telling the story from the perspective of the mole and so for you Jonas you're very young so you only remember Germany as one country yeah. but what did you make of the script when you first read it I mean, how much did you know about this era anyway Okay, so yeah, I'm born in 1990, so uh, Germany for me has always been one. And um, the era of the hot phase of the Cold War is, I mean, it hasn't been like, um, hasn't been in my history lessons because it's the teenage time of my teachers, of course, so it's not history for them. Um, and uh, well, I've heard about, about the Cold War phases and um, about the NATO how does it call is it called double track decision double track decision and um some things but um still this was like this was a phase that was really great for me because i mean i know 
I know more about the Second World War than I know about this uh, the 80s. But still, when I got the um, the first two books, the first two scripts were given to me when I was shooting a film in uh, Prague. And then I had two months um, of preparation time before we started shooting. And I, um, I got to an apartment in Berlin, which was booked for me uh, for this time of shooting and preparation. And there was like this aid of, of books and uh, research material waiting for me. <laughs> like, and I spoke a lot to Anna who had like Thomas, her sources. And um, well, for me, it was nice to get to get in touch with the time by having such a creative and emotional way of dealing with the character, of, with dealing with scripts, a fictional stuff, um, going around historical elements. So for me, it was kind of a time warp, I guess. Nice one. <laughs> and you had a lot to read, but you also did a lot of physical preparation. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. I've never been as sportive as in these days because um, you you won't see it in this episode, but um, Moritz' part is getting real physical. Can you say that? Um, and I wanted to play these parts too, so I took um, like kickboxing lessons three times a week and I was jogging all of the time and the director Edward Berger just uh, got a prize for um, directing this series and he was asked what was his secret and he said I was the I was the man to tell Jonas to run from left to right and again because there were days where we just we were just shooting me running. <laughs> it has to be said Jonas that all the other male actors on the set were always like Jonas looks good running. <laughs> because not very many people look good running. Did, did you know? It oh. was kind of an ongoing thing. And also the they female. were very jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I, I Alexander have... Bayer being like, Jonas looks really good running. <laughs> you know? I have to admit, I, I um, got like a double. Um, double, yeah. A double, yeah. And I met him again now for shooting a film in uh, Denmark. And he, yeah, and he came on set Shadow. because he, I mean, there are not so many stunt doers that are of my age and look quite similar. And he came on set and said, no, no, I don't have a job. <laughs> like, because this was a great time. The only thing he could um, do, there was some few things, but um, Moritz has to jump like four meters high on uh, asphalt. I don't know. No, no, no. On asphalt. Asphalt? Okay. And I said, okay, I'm out. <laughs> and then he could tell me, oh, yeah, I got a job. Come on, let me jump. And he did it like 50 times. <laughs> Only for a second. But um, yeah, but I mean, it was it was part of my character and it was great for me because if you're, I mean, a half of a year shooting means like this is, okay, I say it, it's brain fuck, you know, it's really, it's intensively hard work with your brain all of the time. And if you have days where we can just run <laughs> and um, do stunts and, this, this is just healthy, this feels good, and it was a good mixture in this case. Um, Maria, your character on first glance is sort of the villain of the piece, but she's a lot more complex than that, isn't she? What, what do you make of Lenora? Well, first of all, I have to say, um, I'm really thankful. I'm really thankful for this. Um, I, Anna sent me the first script from the first episode, and um, and I said immediately yes, I want to do it. It's all um, it's written for it, her. It, it felt so right. It felt so right. A project coming from seemed to be coming from nothing but passion and curiosity and interest. And I have to say, a great school your kid is on. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's really no, no. My daughter is seventeen. She has no inkling of what was happening by then. You have, I mean, <laughs> you weren't educated about this time. And, and, and in addition to that, of course, it's uh, um, the very interesting thing about it is, especially for Germany, that the series doesn't take sides at first glance. You know, Lenora is not necessarily an evil person just because she works as an officer at the Stasi and um, and this is what attracts us attracted us by then and also now as fictional characters something like um, a how do you say that in English conviction conviction a true somehow a true belief which is beyond people like us you know uh, growing up in the West can even imagine that at the end of the 
of the road. I have, I, 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 as Maria, do believe that people like Lenora were convinced to fight for a better world. And, and that's what's so interesting about it. Yeah, we had a thing in our room, like nobody is evil on this show, like no character is evil, because it's just really important to remember that, you know, history is obviously written by, written by the winners, and communism was a like a dream that, that fell apart and came to like a terrible end. But the people who were fighting for it really believed in it, and we always wanted that to be really clear, you know? It's also interesting that uh, 1983 was really the year when it kind of switched. If you read the literature or you talk to the people who were involved then, um, before 1983 you were able to convince um, someone to work as a spy because they believed in the GDR, and after 1983 it became more and more about the money. That was the motivation, because it became pretty clear in 1983 that um, the GR was not about to last. I mean, that was the, tipping, it was the tipping point, yeah. They had to borrow money from West Germany, a billion Deutschmarks back then. And, um, yeah, so people slowly lost their appetite. And then, if I may say another little thing. Um, to me, as a German, as a West German, you know, having a project like this, or, or looking at a project like this, I think it also, um, it's just so very special because it has, I mean, I'm not sure if, if you're insulted <laughs> when I say that, but it's also the view onto it from someone who wasn't raised in, in Germany, neither part of it, I would say so. For instance, allowing a character, since you asked me about my character, allowing a character like Lenora to not only be on the evil side, uh, but also this appeal of a female lonely wolf without family, without uh, without kids, and on top of it, uh, some kind of, let's call it mysterious glamour, you know? I wouldn't be so sure if someone who would create that kind of format out of Germany would dare to combine these elements of adventure, of action, and at the same time stick to historical facts because we were also, since in my career I have so many experiences with the other part of German history, doing all these movies about Second World War, and it's clear what happened. It's clear what happened that people who were who had a brain, you know, kind of were shy of using that part of history and doing in, uh, doing something, you know, manipulative of it, and and uh, or something fun would never. I mean, or a fun, I mean, glamour to it. <laughs> <laughs> enjoyable to watch. Let's put it that way. And this is the first German series to be broadcast in the US. It's obviously come here. When you read the script and when you were making it, did you realize it was going to have this profound international impact as well as being big in Germany? No. You never know what's going to happen. I mean, I, you know, it, 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 people always ask that. And, and I think the only thing I can say to that is I'm a foreigner in Germany and I find the story really interesting and I find German history really interesting. So it doesn't surprise me. That, I mean, I'm half American and half British. It doesn't surprise me that, you know, Americans and, and British people are interested in it. But it's hard, you know, you don't, when you're on the inside of something, you don't really think of it in those terms. You're just, you know, you're making the thing that you're, you know, we've all been really in it. It was really intense. So. Just try to make the best version of this, yeah. uh, of this mm -hmm. story. We never thought it would go to the US you know it was also it a strange like that, yeah. it was also a strange coincidence because you know we had scripts in English for a German show because Anna um, and and the writers from were writing it in English so so um, if, you, if you had it. written it in German nobody would have said oh let's translate that script and then send it to the US and see if we can sell it there you know it yeah. would have been absurd so but we since we had it our uh, dear colleague uh, Sarah Duhl from Fremantle gave it to her friend Christian uh, Vespa from Sundance TV. They had worked on Top of the Lake together, 
And he, you know, he read it and he really liked it. And then Anna went to see him in New York and I saw him in Cannes and he became a little bit part of the process. Uh, he even gave us notes and he was, you know, more and more into it. And then in the end, it, it happened. So that's, um, the English language is crucial. Must be exciting, especially for you, Eunice, as a young actor, to suddenly be in America, be traveling around with this piece. Yeah, I've been. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, uh, I've, I've been in New York. Um, for thirty-six I, hours. Yeah. In a car. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. The first, the first evening was uh, being in two jazz clubs. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so Christian was so nice to invite us to a jazz club. Now I know the bigger story about it, but um, we, we've been in the village vanguards and in the basement, like listening to jazz music. And then I've seen the Kurt Elling release concert in Birdland stuff. So I had the most intensive 36 hours in New York of all times. And then we were in the Goethe Institute and uh, showed it to American press who, I mean, like New York, uh, uh, New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, like press that normally like writes about series that I like, that I look up to, and they wrote nice articles about us, so this was a kind of, yeah, it really felt good. <laughs> you have to know that Jonas is a pianist, so, you know, it's, just his, it's like, a little hobby. misleading what we're telling in the episode one. The acting is just his, like, you know, his, it's his hobby. It's just his hobby, but he, he's really a pianist, <coughs> and so he only stayed for 36 hours in New York because he was practicing six hours a day at the time, and he was like, gotta play piano, man, like, I can come for 36 hours, but that's it. So he was, he had like a whirlwind tour of New York away from the piano. So we, we wanted during to make these, sure he saw During these jazz. hours, he was itching to get back to the piano, yeah. right? I remember the lunch where you were like, oh my God, I can't wait. You know, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> but still, it was great. And yesterday I've been at uh, this jazz club around here, Scott. What is it? Ronnie Scott. Scott. Yeah, it was great. I mean, yeah, okay, this is the second passion, but still, I mean, this is really, this is the big world to, to know that our series has been sold to america to russia like a cold russia. war series to, to america and russia stuff and um i know i know that it's going to be shown here too i mean that's why we're here and i'm really glad to be here because i'm a fan of british series so this is really something special for me so. which ones okay so the last thing i've watched was it crowd <laughs> um before that i watched uh, sherlock of course I've watched eric oh i love Derek. This is British, right? Yeah, it's British. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there are some. I've really, I've watched a lot of them. And I just wanted to ask you guys about the soundtrack, because it's a brilliant part of the piece. Was that always important for you guys to use music? Yeah, well? originally we picked um, 1983. Well, we wanted to write something in the 80s, but we, we picked 1983 because it was such an amazing song, uh, year for songs. And if you look at the top 100 of 1983, like, most of those songs are still on the radio. And... It, I lived in Mexico at the time, and it, we were listening to all these German songs that year. So it was this sort of one portal through which I had experienced Germany was that year. And um, and actually, the guy who did our, our sound our score is the composer. His name is Reinhold Heil, and he produced 99 Luftballons. He was yeah, also, he yeah. He was the keyboardist in the Nina Hagen band. <laughs> so he was like, yeah, and, pre and, and a producer, and he produced um, that song. So he was right there in the zeitgeist and he lives in LA now but he's German and he did you know it was that was a big part of it yeah fantastic I think we can have some questions from the audience now if anyone would like to put their hand up Tim has this series oh sorry okay. thank you has this series faced any else it's very good by the way I really enjoy it um has it faced any hostility though in Germany because it revives memories of a less happy time for the country? Um, well, it just aired last night. Uh, it premiered last night in yeah. Germany. I, I meant really more in the build-up to the, the TX of it. Um, no. <laughs> no, it's... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't get the question. Um, so, you th by whom? Who would uh, be offended? Well, we had a series over here earlier this year called 1864. It's a yeah. Danish series. And that apparently was was met with some hostility in, in Denmark because it revived memories of a very unhappy period of history for, for, for that country. I just wondered whether this had done the same because it re reminds people of a time when Germany was divided and when it was effectively at war with one another. I think something that York said is really important. I mean, there's a lot of really terrible things in German history. So Germans have to, you know, when you wake up in the morning, 
you know, this is something we've thought about a lot with our kids because they're American and German, but, you know, Americans are always told it's really great to be American, which is, you know, for, for better or for worse. And uh, Germans are always told it's really terrible to be, or it's really, they should be guilty to be German. It's a very intense thing. To, there's a lot of history to bear if you're German. Um, and the, the funny thing about this period is it's true, it's kind of a dark period in their history, but it's the beginning of a happy ending. You know, we're living in the happy ending in reunited Germany, reunited Berlin. So in contrast to other periods in German history, it actually feels like a, somehow celebratory, even in retrospect, because it feels like it's it has this... Yeah, I, I think what we what we didn't I mean, you for, saw the first episode now uh, what we didn't want to do is uh, just a light you know a light uh, Stasi show so <laughs> there's a journey so it will you know it will it will come to darker moments you know so I feel like it was always important for us to strike a balance between on one hand showing that living in the GR was not just pure hell uh, for for some people and um, um, and on the other hand, it was also not just a fun time to be behind, uh, to be living behind the Iron Curtain. So, but it's also very much about the generation gap. You know, like these are all young characters, and then the older characters are the post-war generation. And um, you know, a lot of people say that World War II didn't really end until 1989, when the world, came, when the wall came down. So, it's a little bit about that kind of tail end of all of those political situations coming together. Well, maybe I can say a very small thing to that. Um, I can say, because I'm not the creator and not the director, and I'm just a little part of it, but um, the, uh, the reviews in Germany are, to me, really incredible. I've never seen something like that. <laughs> From the Spiegel to Bild, they all are, I don't know, they are so excited about it, and it's hard for me to... to to really understand, I, I do think it has to do with, <laughs> because they never are, they never are. And I think it also has to do with this tremendous success coming into the country, you know, like already in German history, Fassbinder told, Wim Wenders told, you know, they've, all of them, you know, they brought the success back into Germany because it, it wouldn't be raised out of the country itself. And I think, I mean, my own personal experience now is that I have a friend, um, he's, a, he's also in the business, he's also an actor, and actors are sometimes picky with each, other, with, each, with each other. But he called me, and he's from the East, and he really was so, he said, thank you, thank you for doing this, thank you for taking part in something which takes the perspective of people from the East without you know, judging. Excellent. I think it's, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I, th I think there's an interesting dramatic tension in, in the fact that we've got as our protagonist somebody who is actually essentially a spy against the West. And we're Westerners and most of us in this room probably regard uh, communist totalitarian dictatorships as quite a bad thing. Certainly um, in comparison with what, what, what else it could, we could have. Can you just talk about the tension in dramatic terms about him being our protagonist? Because when he was taking the pictures, I was on his side. I, was, I, I didn't want him to get found out. He was, he's our hero, isn't he, essentially? And, and you go with it, and then you kind of question yourself as an audience member. And I was just wondering if you could talk about that tension and, and, and how it sort of works creatively. Uh, well, I think that very early on we made, a, we made two really great decisions. One, I think, one was that we wanted a very young man to do this because the automatic character flaw of a young man is that he's innocent. So if the same character were, let's say, in his 40s, he would have seen so many things uh, in his own system, he would be aware of all the, of the dark side of the GDR as well. So he's someone who can uh, discover both sides and uh, he's kind of, um, he's, he's at home, uh, he loves his family, he's just a very ordinary guy in this respect who, who accepts his reality as the truth and the, probably the, the better system. The second great decision I think we did was uh, to cast Jonas because Jonas is, um, um, we both felt that from the very beginning, the um, embodiment of, of someone you really care for and he does it, you know, with amazing uh, conviction and, you know, he's, um, and, and, you know, that's for 80, 80 shooting days, yeah, I think 80 shooting days altogether or 90, I don't know, I don't even remember. 
but um, I remember when we sat with uh, Christian Vesper from Sundance in London, actually, and we showed him uh, five or six scenes that were cut together w while we were shooting. He was just sitting there, and I was sitting next to him, and I was always looking at him and trying to read his poker face, and uh, he didn't really move. And then after the uh, seconds, the, the, the hour, the lights went on, and he turned around, and he said, yeah, you, you really care about this guy, right? You really want him to to make it. And I, then I knew, it was then that I knew that we'll uh, probably uh, go to America. And, uh, you know, he was talking about you. Brilliant. I wondered, is there a real life protagonist that you might have based this on? Was there a spy that you maybe spoke to who underwent a similar mission no. in the West? No. There's no one-to-one -one relationship between real people. But of course, there are many spy stories, and um, we uh, interviewed, of course, people who who were, um, you know, <coughs> agents. For, uh, for one, I mean, the one thing. It's sort of a small dis distinction, but it's important. Um, our characters aren't working for the Stasi directly; they're working for the Foreign Service of the Stasi, which is more like MI6 or CIA or KGB. You know, every country has that, and um, they're they're trained intelligence. For foreign intelligence, and um, after it's, it, he, he has to go to the airport. That's why. Sorry. Um, the um, uh, after the wall came down, actually, Hafoa agents, uh, which is the, what you called it, HVA, um, were really in high demand by the CIA and MI6. They were very good spies. So in that sense, um, yeah, they're just slightly different from the Stasi, and we interviewed a lot of people who were working in foreign intelligence in the past, and also in the present. So that was the really unpopular branch of the uh, Stasi of the of the DDR intelligence were the people who spied on their own people, because back then nobody did that. Uh, right now, <laughs> I think uh, now it's different. You know, we all gotten used to our government spying on us, um, for better or for worse. I just wanted to ask, are we going to see more of life in, in East Germany? We've seen the lives of others in that kind of area. Will we see more of that as the series goes on? Yes. It goes back. There's a few of our characters can are springer. Like, they can they can go back and forth. They can jump. Um, most of the characters are either have to stay in the West or the East. Um, because if you were working for the Bundeswehr, you couldn't go to the East. Um, but uh, Moritz and Lenora and to some degree Tishbeer, I guess. And go back and forth, right? Yeah. But there nobody two, else can cross there were the wall. Two, three thousand West Agenten, they were called, and a lot of them were sleepers. So they were implemented into West Germany at a young age. They made a career, and once they reached a certain level in their career, they were turned on. That's the case for Tischbier. And since uh, you know we wanted something more dramatic for our uh, young hero, we uh, you know chose this scenario. Any more quick questions? I just wanted. To, oh, actually, could I just ask about the uh, the scene where your your um, finger or fingers are sprained? Um, how was that to do? Uh, did you suffer any small injury as a result of it? <laughs> no, my hand was absolutely fine afterwards, but I really had to laugh when I um, read the scene. And of course, this was the first scene I've ever shot for the series. <laughs> it was the first scene, and I broke my finger <laughs> in it, and. Um, there was one one more thing. I, I spoke to Anna. I mean, if there should be a next season, we get some ideas for the fingers. Yeah. We'll see we've basically idea. decided that if we do a second season, it'll be 1986. And we've already decided that in the three years when he's like sent to the Pampas because his uh, identity has been blown in the West and he's sent to, say, Mozambique, um, he's going to learn to play piano. Because, <laughs> you know. So finally get the chance to do it. Oh, use and, that, and, right? You know, when, we, when was, we wrote the character, we didn't know that a pianist was going to play him. So. Wasn't there a scene you told me where he tried to... Um, there was once a scene, you, you told me, there was once a scene where Morris was, would be forced in the West um, to play the piano because his finger has gotten well. And he tries to do like free improvisation without knowing any note and like free jazz. And... Uh, uh, General Edel buys it, but the scene is out. But I love the idea of doing it, of course. <laughs> As perhaps is the case with many uh, first-time series writers, the pilot, the original pilot, was like ninety pages long. So uh, there, there are a lot of good ideas in there. That, you know. 
Brilliant. Any final questions? Yeah, one more. I think one more question. I think one of the perceptions we get when we watch spy things is that the, the Western spy agencies and infrastructure was pretty were pretty stupid. I mean, we had um, Kim Philby and Blunt and all those Cambridge spy rings, and, and obviously he, the character in this, can, can pull the wool over <laughs> General Agel's eyes. Is there, is there a sense that the, the, the West were not, were not particularly as good as, as, as the East in, in, in the spying game? I think the East were probably better, mm. but I don't think it's necessarily true that the West wasn't good. But General Adel, Adel is not a spy, right? So it depends on, he, he's in the army. No, no, what I'm saying is he, he obviously has had the ball pulled over his eyes and, and so forth. He's easily convinced, yeah. yeah. Um, I wouldn't make that judgment, but since our show is about Eastern spies, mm. you know, we like the idea of him becoming a double agent eventually, so... Then we'll learn a little bit more about the Bay and which is the West German uh, spy uh, foreign intelligence. But um, no, I guess I wouldn't have, have made that judgment. I'm sure there were really good spies on both yeah. sides of the wall. Very diplomatic. Very good. No, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, if there's no more questions, I'd like to say thank you so much for thank coming you. over for this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.